a good number of people joining already. So we will go ahead and kick things off. Um, so again, welcome everyone, everyone. And thanks yeah. for joining today's webinar, Fabric Networking in Action. Uh, before we go ahead and make introductions to today's speakers, uh, we will go ahead and go over a few housekeeping items. Um, so first, keep in mind that everyone is in listen only mode. So if you do have questions, just be sure to submit them in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to answer everyone's questions um, at the tail end of the webinar. If we don't get to your questions uh, today live, uh, we will be sure to follow up with you um, after today's webinar. Uh, if you do have any technical issues, um, you can uh, submit that um, in the chat box and we'll try and help you out. And lastly, the session is being recorded, um, so it will be available on demand uh, within 24 hours. It'll be sent out to everyone joining today. Uh, now I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's speakers. Uh, first, leading the session today is Camille Campbell, who is a Senior Product Marketing Manager at Extreme Networks. And we also have uh, two guest speakers and current Extreme customers, David Hankey, who is a CIO at City of Milwaukee, and Terrell Hobbs, who is an Enterprise Architect with uh, the Government of Northwest Territories. And we also joining us today is uh, Dinesh Rigo from our product uh, management team uh, for our Voss products. Uh, he'll be helping with our Q&A at the end of today's session. Uh, now looking at today's agenda, before I go ahead and pass it along to Camille uh, to get started, we're going to uh, take a look at what fabric networking is. Um, so we're gonna take a look at how it's unique in the industry and really what the value is to it. Um, we're also going to touch on you know, looking back for the 10 years that it started, um, we're gonna look back at where it started and looking forward um, where the product is going from here. And then we're also going to dive into how it's been deployed in real life use cases, uh, namely how David and Taro um, have utilized Fabric Connect um, within their own environments. So without further ado, uh, Camille, you can take it away. All right, thanks so much, Kyle, and thank you so much to everybody who's joining us today. And just a huge thanks to both Terrell and David for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us today. Um, we're here to celebrate 10 years of Fabric Connect. And one thing I wanted to point out is David was actually our first global deployment for Fabric Connect uh, ever. And Terrell was actually our first Canadian deployment. So these two individuals have a lot of hands-on experience with this technology. And I really wanted to encourage everybody to ask any questions you might have as we're each going through our sections of the deck. So I wanted to kick things off with just a brief description of what Fabric Connect really is. And Fabric Connect is one of Extreme's fabric networking technologies and the one we're going to dive into today. Um, at the highest level, Fabric Connect really represents a simpler way to design, deploy, manage, and troubleshoot networks. And, uh, you know, traditional routed infrastructures have become increasingly complex for today's very mobile and very dynamic environment. And as organizations embark on digital transformation, there's a lot more emphasis on speed and agility. And this is really where Fabric Connect comes in. Um, Fabric Connect is a network virtualization technology. So what that means is we're abstracting the network services from the underlying physical infrastructure. So there, there is a lot more agility in terms of turning up and changing network services. The infrastructure also has a lot of resiliency, a lot of security. So it provides that nice resilient foundation for a company's digital transformation initiatives. In terms of how the technology might meet some of your business imperatives, one of the things we hear time and time again from customers like, like Terrell and David is that the technology allows them to do things a lot faster. So turning up network services, for example. And the reason that it does that is because rather than provisioning hop by hop along the path, it's really just provisioning at the edge access layers only. You're not having to continually reprovision the aggregation or core. Um, in terms of improving operation efficiency, operating efficiency, um, this is of course something that is absolutely paramount in today's environment. And one of the things that we're doing is we're building automation directly into the networking technology itself. 
So another approach to automation, of course, is to use external tools, program in workflows to take advantage of, of automating various parts of the network. Um, but it does require an investment in tools and an investment in time to set everything up. Our approach is to build as much automation as possible into the network technology itself to reduce that, that investment in time. Um, also contributing to operational efficiency is centralized management tools. So we have an on-premise solution today with Extreme Management Center, as well as a cloud-based solution, Extreme Cloud IQ, and we're evolving towards the option to do a hybrid model as well. Um, reduction of risk. So we live in a very complicated cybersecurity environment. And one of the things that this technology does really well is it allows for network segments to extend end to end across the network with ease and at scale. So this is important for sectioning off any IoT devices and for also reducing the potential attack surface and providing a quarantine function if you happen to be infected with malware or, or even ransomware. It just prevents that propagation across the network. Um, enhanced customer experience. So today, some of the most complicated applications, IP video surveillance, IPTV, patient telemetry, many of these applications run on multicast and multicast can be quite complex in its traditional form. We integrate multicast into the fabric and really simplify the deployment as well as improve the, the scale and performance of those particular applications. And then related to centralized management, we have tools that allow for a detailed collection of analytics related to the network and the applications to be able to fine tune the network and also troubleshoot very, very efficiently. As, I meant, as we mentioned, this is the 10 year anniversary of our first deployment for Fabric Connect. So we have a lot of experience under our belt in building these networks. And we're also deployed in some of the most highly mission critical environments that you can think of. Um, air traffic control, nuclear power plants, critical infrastructure. A lot of these highly mission critical environments rely on this technology. And it is highly scalable. And we, and we have customers that literally have fabric networks that span the globe. Um, in addition, because we have such a vast number of deployments, we do have some third party validation through detailed interviews with our customers in terms of what they find the values to be. And of course we have David and Terrell who will expand on, on their experiences. And then the other thing to note is Fabric Connect represents one technology and it can actually extend end to end across the network. So um, whether you're looking at data center modernization, a campus refresh, extension to the branch, it's one technology or one protocol that can extend end to end across the network. Um, the technology is also applicable for so many diverse environments, whether it be the dense urban center of Milwaukee or the vast Canadian North. So again, you're going to hear about those two totally different environments. Um, and then, of course, the technology is based on standards. And just getting into the standards, the standard behind the fabric technology we're using is something called shortest path bridging. So shortest path bridging represents the evolution of ethernet and it's an ethernet fabric technology. And it, in, it originated in the service provider space, which gives it a lot of the multi-tenancy and multi-segmentation capabilities. Um, without getting into too many details about the standard, um, one of the things that it did introduce was a control plane. And the control plane we're using is something called ISIS. And what this does is it provides deterministic loop-free forwarding over any kind of physical topology. So you're eliminating some of those uh, original complexities with ethernet, flooding and learning, spanning tree, the need to block ports, all that goes away. Um, we also introduce a service abstraction layer. And this not only gives you service scalability, it gives you isolation between each and every virtualized service. And then the last thing to note is this is a multi-service virtualization technology. So it's not only layer two virtualization where you can take a VLAN, extend it anywhere in the fabric. It also integrates layer three VRF uh, capabilities 
and it also encompasses both integrated unicast and multicast routing, both IPv4 and IPv6. And all of this is integrated into the fabric. And this brings me to the original design intent of the fabric. Uh, the inventors really wanted to reduce to the max. Uh, they wanted to get rid of the traditional protocol stack and traditional networks. And they didn't want to go in the direction of overlays where you're adding more control planes and, and more uh, protocols to that stack. So instead, they wanted to look at reducing, simplifying, and putting all of the attributes needed in a modern network technology and doing it with just a single control plane. So this is something that was really innovative 10 years ago, and it's still innovative today. And it's one of the main reasons that we can really simplify and really change the paradigm from a, a design deployment and especially a troubleshooting perspective. To remain innovative into the next decade, we have a number of exciting enhancements that are already available and also being delivered. Um, so enhanced automation, what I talked about, building automation into the technology itself and um, allowing fabrics to be self-forming and self-provisioning. We're also extending Fabric Connect right to the edge of the network um, for greater automation and simplicity. We're also increasing the scale of the technology to allow our fabric networks to grow to the tens of thousands of nodes. And we're doing this through multi-area and you'll see this come out in the early summer. And then cloud management. Cloud is just a strategic imperative for so many organizations across the board. And so what we're doing with cloud is we're integrating some of our switches into our cloud management platform and also giving an evolution path for those who have our on-premise solution to evolve to a hybrid model if and when they choose. And just a little bit more on the automation and the recent software release that we introduced. Uh, basically, we've introduced automated onboarding to both of our, our on-prem and cloud management uh, suites. Um, we've also delivered automation in terms of the automated deployment of our fabric infrastructure. So whether you're adding one switch to a network, whether you're deploying a new fabric, uh, the fabric will automatically uh, self-provision and self-form. In addition to that, if you want to plug in a fabric attach AP or a fabric attach switch, again, that connection will be dynamically provisioned. So we're really getting to a full infrastructure plug and play paradigm. And then when it comes to the edge, we want to deliver that same automation when it comes to automated service provisioning, automated secure auto attach. Uh, we do it today and we're providing an, a different model with extending Fabric Connect right to the edge. So with that, I wanted to thank everybody for 10 years. Um, there are really few technologies that can stand the test of time. I truly believe this is one of them. It was innovative 10 years ago. It's still innovative today. And uh, with that, I'm, I'm so honored to pass it over to David, who's going to talk about his experiences at City of Milwaukee with the fabric technology. Thank you. Um, for the introduction, I'll start a little bit about myself and the City of Milwaukee. So I'm David Henke, the Chief Information Officer for the City of Milwaukee. I've been in this role for a little over a year, but I've been with the City of Milwaukee since 2007, designing and supporting the network infrastructure in one form or another. Um, so the city of Milwaukee is the largest city in the state of Wisconsin with approximately 600,000 residents um, across 95 square miles. And so as, as noted on the slide, we have about 7,000 staff within the city uh, across many different agencies, public safety, um, li libraries, uh, public works, health centers, uh, with over 100 separate buildings for all of these various agencies. So uh, with all of that, we have three full-time staff to support the city's network for all of those agencies. And, as, as you can imagine, they, they have a lot on their plate. Um, next slide. So we have our own backbone fiber uh, that, that the Department of Public Works installs. We're like our own little utility. And then the IT group uh, engineers and manages that. So we have diverse connections to the internet at several different buildings uh, from different carriers and then distribute that across the uh, fabric, utilizing the, the fabric networking um, across the city. So that, that uses um, over 500 switches, 
uh, extending to those hundred buildings. And uh, we've, we're recently uh, working on getting that extended into traffic cabinets so that we can have visibility into those. Um, there's about 700 uh, traffic cabinets around the city. And so we're excited to um, historically, if there was an outage or something, it would have to be physically reported or identified either by a city employee or a citizen having that uh, automation and that, that knowledge uh, in real time. So we uh, um, have multiple surveillance networks. So, and with those for video cameras, regards to public safety, our own uh, building uh, security, and the network team doesn't really get involved in much of those. It's really uh, the cameras are, are connected to the network by those organizations and it, and it just works, which makes it really simple on us. Um, and as noted, uh, we deployed this in 2011 and uh, have continued to grow and enhance that network. Uh, didn't quite realize we were the first ones at the time, but, uh, but glad that we were, uh, we were early adopters and on board. <laughs> Next slide. So at that time, back in 2011, uh, we had a traditional IP network with Spanning Tree and with that large number of buildings, um, any, any outage or network convergence could sometimes take up to 90 seconds to reconverge if there was a broken link somewhere in the network. Um, we also had a, a separate uh, Sonnet-based infrastructure, um, optical network and rings that, that's uh, uh, circuit-based rather than packet-based. And the idea was we wanted to, to move forward with a packet-based network, but still get the resiliency of that Sonnet-based network with the 50 millisecond restoration times. And that's, that's what we're looking at with the fabric attach. So, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's helped with that, with the fabric network to reduce the provisioning timelines and the chance for error. Uh, it's been very resilient. Um, just last week, we had a scheduled uh, maintenance to increase our fiber capacity on our backbone on one of our, our spans. So we were able to just plan that. Um, you know, our ring was open for several hours while the maintenance was done. But, um, but there, was no, there was no impacts to operations when the, when the fiber was cut, nor when it was restored. It was basically a transparent effort. Um, a couple of weeks before that, about three weeks ago, we had a uh, um, unexpected fiber cut. And uh, again, even though it wasn't anticipated, it's because we have resil resiliency in that fabric attached, the packets uh, moved, traffic moved to, uh, to alternate links, and it was um, very seamless. There were one or two non-fabric devices that we had to restore on an emergency basis, but otherwise no one really noticed anything. So it's nice to be able to bring all these things uh, turned up quickly on a normal basis. And then as we continue to grow the network, uh, we've been able to maintain our, our staffing levels and, um, you know, and still be able to support the increased number of sites and switches. Next slide. Yep. Um, so more recently, we've uh, been extending the fabric network quickly to support things like uh, our COVID test site in the last year, obviously impacting everyone. And so we've had test sites that we've had to turn up quickly. Uh, we've had been, been able to do that, um, in, including a s isolation unit for the homeless, where in this case, it was off net. So we were able to uh, deploy the, the latest uh, XA1400, I believe is the product line that lets, lets you, where we don't have our own fiber, we can still tunnel securely with, uh, through that fabric, through the internet, across the internet. Um, we had the presidential elections last year, and part of that was Milwaukee hosting the Democratic National Convention in, uh, in June. That was uh, well-planned before COVID and was, um, you know, we were doing a lot of planning for that and how to get those resources done. And then that changed completely but we still were able to uh, uh, you know, utilize our, our, our network, extend that with all the changes from the convention and the critical requirements and short planning windows and leverage that to, uh, to support what, what turned out to be a much smaller convention. And then now the site that same convention hall is being used as our, our COVID uh, uh, vaccination site, primary vaccination site. We've been able to interoperate with their systems and, and coordinate and change things quickly. Um, you know, the convention itself focused a lot on cameras for public safety, we're able to, to uh, work and turn those up. Um, and now that that was a much less significant event, 
uh, we're working on redeploying those cameras elsewhere to where they'll be for better use on a permanent basis. And again, we can just work with that flow and, uh, and, and are able to, to move things around pretty quickly and efficiently. Um, upcoming right now, we're working on a 911 upgrade where our uh, public safety organizations for police and fire have separate operations. We're combining those and um, utilizing the, the fabric attached to support that and support some of the upcoming features for uh, next gen 911 where they where you can submit via cell phone, get records locations, submit pictures, videos, and live updates through your cell phone and, and we'll be use, utilizing that that fabric infrastructure to support that. Next slide. Yep. So um, yeah, looking forward, like I, like I said, we've uh, been able to extend off net with some of the latest technologies uh, now that we've expanded it throughout our, our, our fiber environment. We've been able to ex expand it off site for sites such as the, uh, uh, the nursery. We have, a, um, we have a, a municipal nursery that's outside the city limits where because the city is an urban environment, uh, um, uh, a nursery environment is outside the city limits and offside our network but we're able to, uh, to ex bring that on net, which we haven't been able to in the past with some of the, the latest uh, XA1400 product line. We're excited about that. Um, and then we you know, continue to, to expand that network into traffic cabinets and other areas as well. Great, thank you so much. So yep. we're now going to pass it over to Terrell, who's going to give us his perspective. turn my mute off. <laughs> uh, thanks, Camille. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks to David for that overview of your fabric network. Uh, the GNWT Technology Services Center, where I work, is responsible for deploying and managing the LANs, the MANs, the WANs uh, within our territory that connect all of our government offices. Uh, it also includes health and education facilities. Uh, the digital network provides data services for about 5,000 plus government employees and another 5,000 users in education facilities uh, and extends to all 33 communi communities across the vast north, uh, many of which are only accessible by plane. Uh, we only have 10 staff to look after the entire network, which keeps us busy, uh, especially when staff have to travel to the other 32 communities to install and or fix equipment. Uh, you know, due to the large and geographical remote area, it's complex and expensive to deliver IT services. Uh, you know, as you can see by the slide, uh, you know, the city of Milwaukee has about 6,000 people in about a 10 square miles. Uh, where in the Northwest Territories, we only have one person in that same 10 square miles. Uh, you know, due to the remote northern area, delivering a digital network for the government education is very expensive. Uh, the the GNWT Technology Service Center, we have an annual budget of about 26 million to provide IT services, and almost half of that is used just to provide the digital network. Uh, we, right now we have fabric that exists in our data centers, uh, government buildings, schools, health offices, and our main hospital. Uh, physical connectivity to all the sites is a combination of fiber optics, copper, microwave services from the main provider in the territory. And our fabric network, as Camille said, was first deployed in 2013. Very happy to be the first in Canada to, to, uh, to old that mark. Uh, it was a, bit, a little bit of a contention a few years ago when we talked about that, but um, I'm glad to hold that, uh, that we can maintain that. Uh, right now we span about five to 600 buildings, and many of which include very small offices of you know, 10 plus people. Uh, the schools and the government networks are completely isolated on their own virtualized network running across a common fiber backbone. Uh, we've deployed approximately 300 fabric attached enabled APs and segmentation within the data center is done so we can separate and firewall between each of our application tiers. You know, we have always been an early adopter of new technologies, trying to keep up with the latest and greatest. Uh, we're continuously evaluating new technologies to see how they might fit into our environment. At the time, you know, we started looking at fabric and there's a lot of emphasis at the time of software-defined technologies. 
And, and right away, I could see that capability exists within Fabric. Uh, when I described you know, how it works to the staff, it took some time to grasp because they're like, really, that's, that's all you have to do? Um, you know, normally in most environments, when you simplify, you lose capabilities. But with Fabric Connect, it simplifies the network while providing better capabilities. You know, we just define services at the edge and the core takes care of itself. You know, here's a perfect analogy. You know, before using Extreme Fabric Connect, it was complex and, and time consuming to add new devices. So it would be like going to the store, you go buy a new toaster, but before you can plug it into the kitchen, you had to call the power company. You'd say, well, you know, I'm, you know, what kind of bread are you going to be using? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to put in a uh, regular toast in that. Why? Well, you know, we, we, we need to know so we can configure that circuit properly. And, and where are you going to plug that in? And, and don't even bother saying, well, you mean maybe I want to move that to another room in the house. You know, it, it, it really sounds silly, right? But, you know, that's the way we used to do things before Fabric. Now with the Fabric, it m makes it almost as easy as using a toaster in your house. You know, the, the, the Fabric network, we're able to create device profiles that dynamically configure the network based on the location where the device is connected. So when a device is connected or it moves to another location, that dy dynamic configuration is removed and it doesn't leave a security hole where something else is connected. So all the controls are at the edge. If you want, you can even burn bagels in your bedroom if you want. <laughs> So our benefit, you know, we don't have to spend a whole lot of time troubleshooting the network because all the different layers and the protocols have been removed. When the switches are Fabric Connect enabled, they automatically learn about the network. So then we can just start deploying new services. Now we go right to the edge and troubleshoot from there and we can make modifications to the network on the fly. So we currently are in the process of upgrading our VSP 9000s, which started our fabric journey many years ago. Um, you know, since all the ports in the core are fabric N and I, there's no spanning tree. We just have to connect new VSPs and they automatically add themselves to a loop free multi path environment. Previously, when we upgraded components in the core, we had long outages due to the complex configurations. Now we're able to to upgrade all the core network devices in staged upgrades with minimal or no network disruption. If you're new to Fabric, well, you know, we've been using Fabric for a long time, you know, both David and I, we can probably test that we know what, we feel like we know it in and out and we've come up with some shortcuts or um, different things. So we have a fairly good methodology and a plan how we put every single node into the network. But now, you know, I think with some of the work that's been going on, there's a lot of new scripts that can be used to configure the switches. And even with the zero touch fabric onboarding, it's gonna make things a lot easier. So, you know, when you get a new fabric switch, just say, here, yeah, let's configure it up and start using it. Don't be scared to use it. Uh, in order to manage that vast network, uh, we decided we needed to deploy Extreme Management Center for centralized management. Uh, if, you know, somebody calls into our service desk and they complain about slow response time for a particular applica application. Previously, we'd have to go in and we'd trace through that hop by hop, every single device along the way, just to figure out where the person is and what they're connected to and what problems may be along the way. Now with XMC, we can see the user because it's integrated into our Active Directory and it tells us exactly where they're located, what switch they're located on, how their network is configured and what type of device they're logging in with. We get a single pane with all the information rolled up into one view. With network access control, we have the ability to do dynamic port configuration. We're able to deploy generic configuration for switches so that all the services, the VLANs and ISIDs are dynamically provisioned as users and devices connect to the network. The, the switches also have analytics built right into them. So the application telemetry uh, allows us to see the application response times for various applications. So one use that we, we looked at was uh, due to the impact of COVID as many people ran into, uh, we experienced a sudden growth of remote workers and collaboration apps. Uh, so using data analytics, we're able to report on how much traffic was used for collaboration. For example, like Microsoft Teams. We were, we were able to determine that teams consumed 25% of the available bandwidth we had 
which you know really helps us justify that we need more bandwidth to to accommodate and and build on those applications. So we installed a brand new hospital, and with that new hospital it had 200 access points. It had, I, I want to say, a couple of thousand um, network drops. Uh, we decided to do full fabric connect network with network access control. Uh, since the hospital is a very complex environment, there's a requirement to section off medical devices such as patient monitoring, uh, infusion pumps without, you know, from the rest of the network. It would have been very tricky to install without network access control. Uh, you know, going to each individual port and saying, oh, this is the VLAN I want for this one, and this is, and you couldn't move things. But we were able to deploy generic configurations on the switches and then let access control determine and provision all the segmented VLANs. For patient monitoring, you know, we were very leery because it used multicast and we had never used multicast before. Uh, it's, it was very cool to see it being introduced into the fabric. Uh, all the, the, the ICIDs were dynamically created across the backbone to support the multicast traffic. And we didn't have to configure anything in the core. It was, it, I was like, well, why are we worrying about this? It's really simple. Uh, in our case, the, the old and our new hospital were right beside each other. So we were able to do a live migration in one day from the old network to the new one. All, they just started moving the patients over, wheeling them over in their beds from one hospital to the next. The patient care wasn't impacted. So we use wireless access for employees uh, and the public within the hospital. And we're also working with the museum to, to deploy access points there. Uh, we're starting to deploy Wi-Fi 6 technology with our new access points. Uh, and in the, this summer, we're planning on uh, installing VSPs in all of our remote communities. Uh, this, uh, they'll all be Fabric enabled by using Fabric Extend uh, to connect across a private WAN. We use analytics to, to see the best way to utilize that bandwidth in each of these locations because bandwidth is very expensive up here. Uh, we can create a fully virtualized network over the WAN with segmentation con to control traffic between government offices, education facilities, and voice services. And you know, looking towards the future, we're you know we're looking at uh, location services uh, with BLE, uh, things like uh, you know being able to move to a, a network and application analytics to a people-centric analytics. Um, maybe see uh, how many people or repeat, repeat customers at a museum. You know, things like that. We're caught, you know, kind of looking at uh, potential use cases there. Um, even uh, moving to the cloud, being so remote, we've been uh, very, uh, let's, let's call it cautious optimism. Um, every organization really has different challenges and requirements with the cloud. And there really been some exciting capabilities available with the new features being added at cloud speed almost daily. Uh, so really, we're looking forward to using extreme I cloud IQ in a flexible deployment that really works the best for our organization. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. A uh, huge thank you to, to Terrell and David for sharing your stories. It's just so valuable. Um, I wanted to turn it back over to Kyle and Dinesh um, to just see what has come in through the Q&A panel. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, there are a few um, here that came up first. Um, so I'll go ahead and present these to you guys. Um, I think these first couple um, are mainly for uh, Terrell and David. Um, first question that came through is, uh, do you have any advice for other government entities just starting a network refresh project? Let me unmute here. Sure, I can, I, I can take a crack at that first. <laughs> So um, just from our history, you know, since the deployment to Fabric Connect 10 years ago, we've gone through one additional network refresh project. So um, the initial Fabric deployment 10 years ago was done, we were under some, some pressure to get the legacy unsupported equipment replaced. So that was kind of a stressful time, um, but the cutover ended up going very well. Uh, our most recent network refresh was done simply to upgrade hardware that was reaching into support but it relied on the same underlying fa fabric uh, technology and it was quite smooth and seamless. So I guess my advice would be to be sure you're working with a solid and, and stable company. Um, 
you know, getting feedback from others using the product, whether it's through a form like this or through other references helps a lot. And, you know, identifying a product that will be standards based for interoperability and will work long term. Um, it's also valuable. Awesome. And Terrell, do you have anything uh, to add to that or? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the, the biggest thing for us is we um, we find interoperability with other vendors quite easily. We have another a, n a number of other vendors in our network that that don't understand fabric and don't work well with them. Um, but really, at the end of the day, we can do, you know, the whole entire fabric network. But uh, really, when we interconnect with other devices, it's, it's really just VLANing at that point, right? So it really makes it flexible to stretch or, you know, really segment out that VLAN without having to worry about wires. Um, you know, that was, I think, a big thing for us. We didn't have to worry about abandoning our and, you know, our other vendors that were firewalls or load balancers or those type of things, there is a, an easy interconnect there. Um, the other one that, you know, for us, again, like David said, you know, many years ago when we started working on it, there wasn't a lot of um, uses out there. There wasn't a lot of other people that were using it. So we, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to plan out and figure out how everything's going to work. Uh, I think a lot of that, you know, there's a lot of white papers now that Extreme has that talk about you know, best practices and um, and guides to help you with that. Um, and, and in our case, we don't have a lot of local partners to, to help us with that. So if you do have access to a partner, definitely reach out to them, um, you know, get them, whether sometimes you may have to convince your partner and say, hey, yeah, here's this Fabric Connect from um, Extreme. You really need to be using it and it'll help them build with other customers. Um, but working with a strong partner, I think that can help you with that. Um, you know, for us, again, like I said, the planning was a big thing and um, it, it was definitely uh, a bit of whether it's scared. I, well, I don't want to implement this new protocol over top of everything else. It really wasn't like that. It was it was more like enabling the features on the, the VSPs that really let us just start building out the network and migrating to it really gradually. It didn't have to be a flash cut overnight type thing. So um, I guess watch some, there's some really good videos that Extreme has there that I've seen and uh, get on and watch those and, and don't be scared to set up your own little lab and figure out how Fabric Connect works and, and, and start playing with it. You'll really start to almost second guess yourself how easy it is and, and how, how well it works and how flexible it can be. Awesome. All right, thanks guys for that input. Uh, very insightful. Uh, next question that we have for you guys. Um, can you talk about um, how you can secure funding uh, for network upgrades, especially when the network's working well? Uh, sure. So that's that's definitely a challenge for us. Um, the city of Milwaukee is uh, always budget constrained or looking how to do that. And when you have a, a, a well running network, you know there's a there's a, a a thought that it'll continue to run well forever. Um, so that can be a challenge. So we generally run systems for as long as they're supported by the manufacturer. Uh, and whenever there's a lack of manufacturer support or there's some unpatchable security vulnerabilities or incompatibility with the latest standards, you know, we know it's time to upgrade and our budget office is generally receptive to those reasons. Um, you know, we provide, we try to look into the future and forecast in a five-year budget plan. So providing that information to, to our budget office two or more years in advance, so they know that that uh, that this is coming and that, you know, there's a product that's going to um, be end of life or it's time to do that. You know, letting know in advance really helps to keep those anticipated costs from being a surprise to them and, and helping uh helping with that process. So as long as as long as they know it's coming well in advance and we have good justification for um, you know the need to continue operating in a well-supported environment like we have, they're, they're usually pretty receptive to that. Awesome. Great. And Terrell, anything to, uh, to add to, to that subject um, about uh, securing funding? Sure. Yeah, we, uh, you know, as a um, public entity, we, we get, I guess, annual um, budgetary allotments of, of money that we have. And we have a very, very good process of uh, having a five-year cycle for um, doing refreshes on our equipment. So we pretty much, um, <clears throat> you know, have it laid out years in advance of where capital refreshes are going to happen, especially when it's a large deployment. 
Um, and that's really, I guess the, you know, for us, it's been easy at that point. It's so we're, we're definitely been watching, you know, as, as new uh, technologies come on board, as new equipment gets released uh, with new functionalities, we're always looking at, well, what is the, what is the next thing and trying to keep up with that. So um, I'm definitely, you know, trying to keep on top of the, um, I guess the, the sessions that Extreme has, especially when they have the Extreme Connect, you know, there's definitely been a wealth of knowledge that I've get out of that and kind of what is the future for different projects uh, coming out with. It seems like they're introducing something and then I'm like, okay, great. Now, how am I going to find the money to spend on that for this year? Um, and, you know, we've been pretty lucky that we've always had um, some money and be able to do that. Um, and, and I think the other thing that, you know, for me personally is, with all the functionality that we get with fabric, I, I'm not spending as much as I would with potentially other vendors. I find that I get a really good value for the amount of money that I do spend. Um, that's really, quite frankly, been one of the big reasons why why we continue to reinvest in the technology. Awesome. Appreciate all that detail. Great. Uh, third question uh, that came through here. Um, do you have a mixed environment and does this technology interwork with other vendors equipment? Uh, so sort of a two-part question there. So, yeah, so at the city of Milwaukee, we definitely have mixed environment. Um, the two-part question, I can kind of talk to two aspects of that um, and how the technology interworks with other vendors equipment. So for example, I, I referenced our convention center being used for the Democratic National Convention and, and the COVID vaccination site. And at that location, we've worked with, uh, worked with them and their interoperability has been fairly easy to coordinate with, with little notice. It's simply, the core is there and it's simply like another edge interface, if you will, uh, provisioning the VLANs or the necessary configurations as you would at an edge. Uh, another example or a different uh, way we do that is working with partner agencies, um, particularly with public safety at the state or county level, for example, to uh, uh, seamlessly transport their traffic when needed, since we have that fiber infrastructure and backbone throughout the city. And it's as simple as just establishing a new ISIS um, uh, network that's completely isolated and segregated from the rest of the city. Uh, and, and it's almost, and so in that case, they can plug in and it's like they have their own virtual fiber uh, across our, our network and across our, our mesh that's you know fully redundant. So we're able to support that as well. Awesome. And Terrell, anything to, uh, to add there? Sure, yeah. Um, like I mentioned before, you know, we definitely have other vendors that don't understand fabric, but there's, they work perfectly well with it. They understand VLANs. Uh, you know, the fabric gives us the flexibility that we can present and use any VLANs that any other vendor would use, and we can transpose those into a fabric ISID to go across the network. Um, you know, really creating a layer two VSN, or in some cases, uh, a layer three to do routing. Uh, you know, part of our network expansion that we're working on this summer is, is working with our carrier to um, to make it so that our fabric extend can work natively across their network, um, which just requires a larger packet size to make that work. But in cases where that doesn't work or you don't have that option, uh, you know, things like, like David said, the, the XA1400 platform, um, you know, those things now give you the ability to, to create an IPsec tunnel across any IP routed network uh, and now extend your fabric out there. Um, the, you know, that's a an, an potential option. I think they're even, um, Dinesh can maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they're actually working on some of that being integrated in some of the products that don't even require the XA1400. Yes, yes, correct, Terrell. Yes. Uh, we have what we call a fabric IPsec gateway that can be run as a VM on products like the uh, VSB7400 and 4900 that uh, will provide you with the encryption and and I was also busy answering a few questions on the side in the chat. So if, if I've not completely answered your question, uh, feel free to clarify. Yeah, no, I think you, you nailed it on the head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Having that capability without having to, you know, put another piece of hardware in, I think is something that, that I've been looking forward to and something that will kind of, if, if we don't get what I guess we're looking for, 
from our carrier, then yeah, we can we can look at implementing that that as an option too, right? So definitely, yeah, that flexibility to work with anything. You know, it's it's not. There's definitely some extensions. I think that Extreme has added to it to to really expand it and extend it out. But really, right from day one when they said, "Here's here's the technology. This is how we're using ISIS for SPV." None of that's changed. Like right, that base technology has stayed the same ever since it was deployed. So it's not. You know, there's the one slide that Camille had up that said, you know, once once you've received something that is perfect, you're not making any modifications to it. I think it's kind of maybe rewording it, but um, it, there, there hasn't been any change to that original protocol that was developed and and as a standard, right? So it, it's anybody that wants to use it can use it, or it's not like it's putting something in place that makes the interoperability not work with other vendors. Awesome. Great. So from my end, it looks like that's all the questions I can see. Dinesh, is there um, any other questions um, that you can see from your end that you might want to um, yeah, present here? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So um, I'm going to put you guys on the spot and ask you, have uh, either of you had any experience running VMware's NSX over the, uh, the Fabric Connect uh, networks that you have today? So I... I, I personally have not for our IT department, but I know that our public safety agencies um, utilize VMware technology and use the, use the uh, network virtualization platform for connecting their various uh, VMware servers, storage and environment. So I, I believe it's out there and that's one of those things, I guess I can't guarantee hundred percent that that particular application is in use, but I, I believe it is and it just, you know, it just it just plays well, whether over the top of Fabric Attach or alongside of it. And, Great. and I guess for the, Go for ahead, the yeah, okay, uh, for the government, uh, yeah, we we haven't really gone into the NSX, but I think in a lot of cases, it's really you know a case by case ba basis on how people need to use it, depending on how their network is. Uh, we own and manage our own data centers. We have two of them in, in Yellowknife. And so we really have access to all the dark fiber, all our services inside the data center. So we don't have to worry about extending, extending out into another provider or extending to a location that requires some other network provider services. So we've been pretty lucky and fortunate that way that you know all the VMware that we do run in our data center, um, I, I don't need um, other technologies like NSX or or even DVR because you know it's really a close proximity. Um, I can just present a VLAN in either data center, and they can say, "Okay, great, I can put a server in this VLAN." Away I go. They don't they don't have to really inform us where things are or how they work. Uh, so in our case, we're pretty fortunate that way. But I, I I have been aware that there are other organizations that require using you know a VXLAN to extend. Um, NSX services across the network, um, as well as you know things like DVR that they don't want uh, network tromboning and stuff like that to exist. Um, and and it was part of some early beta testing with it, but uh, didn't really have a good case new case for for our, in our case or so. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, again, based on both of your personal experiences, there's a question over here about uh, cord upgrades and and the impact of court upgrades on downtime of the network. So maybe you, you give your candid answers on your personal experiences. Sure. So we generally do an upgrade of our, our core systems and our fabric attached systems once a year. Uh, we schedule that during the, there's always things going on at the city, but generally in, 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 in the summer, we have a, a slower time that we do that. And, uh, and it'll have, if, it's basically a reboot for those things that are directly attached in a non-redundant manner. And so there's an outage of you know, five to 10 minutes as a, as a code reboot takes place. For anything that's redundant, uh, that have connections via multiple fabric, fa fabric attached connections, there's basically no impact at all. So all of our critical systems that we have for our, whether it's a you know, core phone systems or server systems, that we and data center, you know, core data center infrastructure that that is all fabric attached. There's there's basically 
there's basically no downtime for those edge switches we have that aren't taking advantage of that and are just a, a, a single uplink connection, then yes, during a typical you know, power cycle reboot to upgrade that code, it might be, it might be five to 10 minutes, but otherwise any, any fully redundant system is, is completely seamless. Yeah, and I would, and thank you. Go, go ahead, Terrell. I, I would agree with you know most of what David said is that yeah, pretty much any upgrades that we do, um, you know, again, depending on the level of upgrade. Um, in, in our case, uh, when we initially deployed our VSP 9000s, we we had lots of interfaces in it, and that was what connected off to every single building we had. So, in the case of the one that we're doing here, actually coming up in the next month, uh, the the core upgrade there we're actually in the process of removing a lot of those um, interfaces that are directly connected to the core and we're actually changing the physical hardware out. Um, so it's gonna require a little bit of a downtime for us um, to, to put that in play. But what we've been doing, you know, kind of as a staged approach is uh, removing all those Fabric Connect NNI endpoints out of the core so we can now offload them to other devices. And, and then as David said too, having uh, you know, redundancy. So having two uh, SPV links off into different devices that can let us really, you know, we're actually doing another one here on Monday where we can migrate uh, an end switch from one, one device to another device, really causing no downtime because the fabric automatically routes around it. Uh, when you plug it into the new device, it just says, hey, you're a SPV node. What is your, it gets all the information about that node and just says, yeah, great. Here's that shortest path to your device or whatever is on that side. It really kind of takes a lot of that reconfiguration and guesswork out of it. All the ports in the core are really just fabric ports. So you can pretty much just move them around to wherever, whatever switches you want. So we've been able to do a lot of upgrades by just routing our fabric paths and fabric connections you know, through fiber connections across different devices. Um, but once we have physically have to remove the box you know one of them we have to remove to get the rack space so we pretty much have to shut it down to put another one in uh, but the other one we can we can do a bit of a you know almost like a rolling upgrade but they're a little bit different platforms a little bit different uh differences between them so uh it's going to require a little bit of downtime but definitely you know not a similar type of downtimes that we've had in the past uh it's and especially the complexity is not there so um you know even if we get into the future we say we want to do just even software upgrades in the core, then we're expecting that to be almost like a hitless upgrade because we can do one core at a time. The other one's going to pick up all the traffic and, and just continue going, right? So. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Terrell and David. Um, there were a few questions about uh, the size of the network with Fabric Connect. And I know that both of you started um, fairly small before you kind of grew the network to the extent that uh, that uh, you've grown to today. Uh, so just to answer that question, so what is the smaller size of network uh, for which I can leverage the benefits of Fabric? And, and uh, I don't know if either of you wants to comment on that, or if not, I can just go ahead and comment. I, I can just state that, you know, we started out with our, our core infrastructure and that's where it was first deployed. That was a probably a dozen nodes at our centralized sites. And then as we've grown over the years, so that, that's, you know, and there was, there was value in that, just having those 12 core nodes where we could have a ring topology with the, um, you know, 200 millisecond or less failover and seamless failover, uh, adding in additional links to provide a mesh environment where the traffic is just routed no matter where, where a link may fail. It just automatically routes, even in that, just those, those dozen core devices themselves. And as time has gone on over the past years, we've added the, you know, the intermediate switches and the edge switches to gain, to gain that functionality features and benefits farther and farther out into the network. And you know, as, I, as I was discussing earlier in my presentation segment, you know, we're trying to get that as far out as just individual traffic cabinets if we can. Great, thank, thank you, David. And yeah, to further add to what David said is, we have a number of customers that, that are actually running some pretty small fabrics. They have four to six switches that are running Fabric Connect and they still find that it is very beneficial for their environments. Yeah, I, so, I would even say- Go ahead, that, go ahead. You know, in an environment, you can create fabric as simple as two switches. Like really, 
it doesn't absolutely it doesn't yeah. take that much there's no central server that they have to register with they don't have to um you know really there's no central thing that's controlling them right there's just you get two nodes you'd say hey these two ports are in an i you put your configuration on the switches and they'll start talking to each other so even if it's just two switches and you have a vlan on one switch and a vlan on the other switch the fabric can worry about what vlan is transported between them right um that's as simple as it gets now i guess the, the other part of your question you said well how big can it get um i know at one point there was some limitation of the number of nodes um and i think there's some um because it was always that you only have one spb area but i believe there's been some work on that yeah uh, and some yep. upcoming stuff for that multi-area coming soon yeah so uh looking forward to that because i know at one point it was like well if you're using um a 4800 ers switch you can only have i think at the time it was like 450 nodes we're getting pretty close to that so um you know definitely i think uh, looking for the uh multi-area and how that can now um help us go really beyond and go almost to go to a, like an infinite number of nodes is going to be exciting yeah Camille, I'm going to put you on the spot with this next question. There is uh, one customer that's looking for the easiest way to gain exposure to design and operation of Fabric Connect because they have a more traditional network. Yeah. So maybe you can, uh, off the top of your head, point to some training resources that we yeah, have through yeah, Stream absolutely. Academy. Absolutely. I, uh, we do have quite a number of videos on YouTube. Um, so check out the Extreme YouTube channel. Um, we also have some free training that's available through our dojo, which gives you all the fundamentals of Fabric Connect. Um, another thing to do is on GitHub, we actually have um, a virtualized version of the Fabric Control Plane and, and maybe even Data Plane now too, Dinesh. But, but certainly you can download that into your environment and start getting some hands-on knowledge with the protocol. And then of course, call, call on one of our engineers um, the other thing we do is we often run hands-on uh, workshops uh, regionally. So those are really useful because I think Fabric Connect can be abstract until you really get hands-on with the technology. I think the hands-on training is so valuable. So we do often run hands-on workshops. So, so Terrell, this one's specific to you because you had talked about uh, looking at uh, XIQ and integrating with XIQ. And uh, the question is, uh, can you talk about your plans about your uh, transition to, to XIQ? And, and maybe it's a little premature to answer that, but give it your best shot. Sure, yeah, no, I've uh, definitely um, been in some discussions of and, and watching a lot of different things on how um, XIQ works and how that transition could be. Um, you know, I, I'm excited I guess for me personally, you know, I, I guess I, you know, in terms of where we are, you know, the north is pretty far away from the cloud, even though the cloud is everywhere, but it still takes a significant amount of data and distance to get to, to the cloud, right? Uh, so I've been working with XIQ. Um, there's, you know, like I said, there's been some uh, free, uh, you know, attend a webinar and you get a free AP so you can see how XIQ works. Uh, I've done that. And, and, and for me, again, coming from a traditional background, I'm still interested in something local. So I believe there's a XIQ site engine, which now you can take the power of Extreme IQ and really put it into an appliance on premise um, so that you don't have to worry about well, where you are in the cloud. So, um, you know, from what I've read, uh, there is definitely a lot of um, any different platforms. There's a public cloud, private cloud or on-premise cloud that you can run Extreme IQ. So I'm definitely gonna be um, working with Extreme to see how we can transition you know, our, our XMC into Extreme IQ, Extreme IQ Cloud and, um, and ensuring again, like, you know, we don't wanna lose any functionality of course, but um, our, our primary concern is keeping our data local um, and control local because we've had a number of occasions where the cloud has per se disappeared because our internet we really only have a single connection that takes us to the internet and um, we've had some um, uh, people that have decided that they didn't want 
to be connected to the internet anymore and they affected the entire territory. So uh, that's been on more than one occasion. So um, definitely, I think trying to get us to a point where, you know, if we're not reliant on cloud and have all that, that same ability, um, you know, whether maybe you'll lose functionality when the cloud goes away and you get it back when it comes back, but definitely having a local site engine so that we can um, do all of our configuration deployments and as well as getting all the analytics and all that cool data that you can get out of uh, XIQ now is going to be really cool. Excellent. Thank you. And I realized that we are two minutes past the top of the hour, but there's one, one question that came up uh, that I have to address. And that is, which of the extreme switches support Fabric Connect? And uh, it is the VSP family of switches. And then if you look at the newer universal hardware of uh, switches that are being rolled out by Extreme, if you run the VOS or the VSP operating system, you will have full Fabric Connect capabilities. The XR switches run a feature called Fabric Attach that significantly simplifies the attachment of those uh, edge VLANs and services, if you may, to an, to an existing Fabric Connect infrastructure. And there's all Hopefully those ERS switches out there. Don't forget all those oh, that's ERS true. How can I, how can I forget the ERS switches as well? Yes, thank you. And, <laughs> you know. and don't forget the Extreme Access Platform. That one's come up a couple times as well. Yep. And that's for remote branch offices. All right. Well, thank you so much for everybody for attending the webinar. A huge, huge thank you to Terrell and David for sharing their experiences. It was so valuable to, to hear about your real world deployment with this technology. So thank you so much. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Kyle. Any, any last words or... Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining today. Just keep in mind that we will be following up with you um, within the next 24 hours with a link to the on-demand recording, um, as well as a copy of the presentation from today. But really appreciate everyone's time for joining us, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think we may have to, oh, Kyle's gonna provide a link. <laughs> There's a question from Scott Cheval. He says, how many clients run two switches only? <laughs> <laughs> he says he's got clients that run two switches just for multicast. <laughs> Okay, we'll switch over to Kyle's bridge. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Terrell, do you Kyle's link? Uh, I'm gonna drop from here. There's another I'll, I'll send you an email. Sure. So drop this and join the other one, is that what you're saying? Yeah.